Welcome to another episode of Captured Killers. My name is Kim and if you like crime videos like I do, hit that subscribe button. Today we are going to be talking about the crazy case of Amber Hilberling and Josh Hilberling. This case is kind of tricky and so I'm going to need your help at the end. Amber ultimately was convicted of pushing her husband out of their 25th floor apartment window. So once you have all the details, please leave down in the comments your opinion. Do you think she did it or did she not do it? Because it is very much a tricky one. All right, the comment of the week is from Heather Hernandez, and this is from the Sons of Anarchy Johnny Lewis video. I haven't heard of this drug, but I don't know much about it either. So there was this drug smiles that everybody was confused about. Thank you, Heather, for commenting. I did put a survey up on my community tab to see which day you guys would like to see me post. I'm gonna be posting two times a week, uh, my second day is really going to depend on what day that ends up, so I'll keep you posted on that. All right. Amber Hilbering was born as Amber Michelle Fields, and she was born on October 1st, 1991 in Joplin, Missouri, to her parents, Michael Fields and Rhonda Bowers. When she was three months old, is when they decided to move to the Tulsa area, Tulsa, Oklahoma. As uh, she grew up, she attended school. Amber was described as a very smart and athletic student. She was involved in most sports, soccer, track, volleyball, and she was even involved in dance. Like she stayed busy. She was very active in school. And all the while, she's still maintaining a 4.0 GPA, which is amazing. It, it shows that she had some drive because while doing all these sports and still maintaining a 4.0 GPA is just not easy. Her parents ended up divorcing. And so she ended up moving with her mom and her stepdad, or eventually her stepdad. Her mom didn't long after marry Dr. Brian Whitlock, and he was a plastic surgeon, so they were doing okay in life. She was not wanting for much in life. Amber's mom, Rhonda, was also a nurse, so between the two of them, they were doing pretty good. Josh. Josh is eventually who she married and that is the victim in this case. So I'll talk a little bit about Josh. Josh Blaine Hilbering, he was born on May 30th, 1988 to his parents, Patrick and Jean Hilbering. They said that their son was a very sweet boy and he would basically give the shirt off his back for anybody. He went out of his way. He put others in front of himself. He just generally sounded like he was a caring, kind person. And that's probably why Amber was attracted to him. He had a large family. He had three brothers and two sisters. Uh, he was a big family football player. So you can see how these two were drawn to each other. He was athletic, she was athletic, and he was hot. Like he was a very attractive man. He was about 6'4", very tall, 200-ish pounds, and was a stunning looking guy. He had a beautiful smile. I'll put a picture up. Oh my gosh, he's he's a cutie. He's a cutie. After high school, Josh then would join the Air Forces. And so that's what he did right after high school. Josh and Amber. Okay, so they met um, in 2008 at a Halloween party. They kind of blew each other off, but that's how they initially met, basically through friends at a Halloween party. So in 2010 is when they actually started dating and getting serious with each other. And it was said that they fell in love pretty quick after that. It, they seem like the perfect couple. He's the jock from high school. She was the athletic uh, smarty pants. And so their attraction was definitely noticeable that they were falling in love. Amber described him as the love of her life. She was very open how much she cared for him. And their relationship moved kind of fast. So he was in the Air Force and she was quick to uproot and move to Texas with him when he was completing his basic training. 
And then not soon after his training was completed, he had his orders that he needed to move to the Eltsin Air Force Base in Alaska. And so for Amber to be able to move with him, they needed to be married. That's the only way that someone could live with you on the base that wasn't in the Air Forces. And so they decided, we wanna be together, we're gonna go ahead and get married. So in August of 2010, they applied for the marriage license, had a small courthouse wedding, and they ended up moving to Alaska. It would be definitely a neat opportunity to live in Alaska, but remember Amber had been living this life uh, with her parents, having her family around, her friends. And now she's moving to Alaska where she doesn't have that huge family foundation. She doesn't have the luxuries that she had back home. And so it was described that it was kind of a tough time. And it, I think it would be a tough time for anybody just uprooting your life, but a neat opportunity at the same time. And it was about this time that the relationship was taking a turn. There was a lot of arguing. Uh, it was escalating. They just were not happy. And, but during this time, they did manage to, uh, to make a baby. Uh, Amber became pregnant. But less than a year, which I couldn't find the exact reason, but he was honorably discharged. Josh was honor honorably discharged from the Air Force. And it's not clear exactly why, because typically you sign up for a couple years, but his didn't last for more than a year after his training. So I'm not exactly sure. There was some rumors, some speculation, but I'll get to those later. And again, these are things that came up in the trial. So we'll talk about those. So they ended up moving back to the Tulsa area. They moved in with Amber's parents they were getting a house built, but things at the parents' house just were not going smoothly. And it's interesting, this interview that she had, that she was being recorded, that she didn't know she was being recorded, which we'll talk about more. But uh, in her interview, she made a statement saying, it's been a tough year, um, getting kicked out of my parents' house. So she did make mention that she was asked to leave. But what her parents did is set her up in this apartment that they had. Because he's a doctor, a plastic surgeon, people would fly in or reps would fly in or other doctors or whatever, and he would set them up in this apartment. That apartment was empty, so their house was going to be done on June 1st, but it actually, the contractors pushed it out and it wasn't going to be ready until the 15th. So they had a little bit of time and they had that apartment. So Amber's parents were like, just go stay there for a couple of weeks and until your house is done. And I tried to find what are these people doing for a living? They're getting a house built. They're living in this high rise apartment. Where are they working? Amber's pregnant. So um, I couldn't find anything that she was working anywhere. But Josh, the only thing that I could find is he was possibly selling drugs, but I didn't see that he was employed anywhere. So I don't know if that was somewhere else. I couldn't find it, but there wasn't a lot of information about that. On Tuesday, June 7th, 2001, Amber and Josh have only been living in this apartment for two weeks. This apartment was the eighth tallest building in the city. Like it was a tall building and it was the 14th tallest building in all of Oklahoma. It had 32 floors. It, it was a beautiful place that overlooked the river. It was really, really nice. They, they were living pretty good. And it was only short term, you know, it was only short lived. But so at this point, they've only been there for two weeks. On this day, Amber and Josh had been arguing like crazy. They were not getting along. They haven't been getting along. It sounds like their relationship was a bit toxic to say the least. And of course, Amber is now seven months pregnant, so she's starting to show. She's probably feeling like crap, tired, all the things that come with pregnancies. And so their argument had carried over from the day before. Amber's father was getting married, and Josh and Amber 
were set to be part of the wedding party. And Josh apparently told Amber that he just didn't want to go. They're not getting along. It's her father. He, he didn't want any part of it. And this angered Amber. Josh said that he wanted to go to a concert with his friends in Tennessee. And Amber later said he only wanted to go to that concert so he could sell drugs and make money. But what had happened was they were arguing and Josh ended up throwing a laundry basket. This laundry basket, apparently a pretty heavy duty laundry basket, broke their window. And so they needed to call maintenance to come and fix this window that got broken by a laundry basket. The window that was broken was actually located in the bedroom that led out into a balcony. So maintenance comes to look at the window. There's two gentlemen that walk in and they instantly could feel the tension in the air. You know, whenever you go over to somebody's house or go out to dinner with somebody and they're arguing, you can kind of tell that their demeanor is a little cold, a little standoffish, you know, not chipper. And so when they walked in, they could clearly tell that they were not getting along. So the two men, the two repairmen were already in the building replacing other windows. So they ended up going up to their apartment, which was 2509, 25th floor. One of the repairmen decided that he needed to go down to the truck to get more supplies. So the other repairman was just kind of tinkering around, looking at it, and stayed in the bedroom. He actually walked out onto the balcony, was looking at the outside. And in a later interview, this maintenance worker were, did notice how angry Josh was. Like he particularly noticed it more on him than he did her. And he was actually concerned about Amber's safety. Was she safe? You know, she's seven months pregnant. And so, like I said, the repairman's kind of tinkering around. The other one's down in the truck. Amber and Josh end up going into the living room. And the man on the balcony, the repairman, all of a sudden hears this loud crash and glass break. His coworker that was getting things out of the car actually yells out to him and said that he saw somebody fall from the window. And so the other maintenance man goes out to the living room and he's expecting to see Amber hurt by Josh because he already had it in his mind that he feels like she's in danger. And he was thinking that Josh had hurt her and then jumped out the window committing suicide. He saw that Amber was fine and she was just hysterical. She was screaming and he sees this broken glass. It was a, it was a scene. Another man was just down downstairs taking a break on the parking garage and he heard a loud crash. And he looked up towards the apartment building and he just seen something falling fast. And it took him a minute to actually realize what he was seeing. But what he was seeing was a man falling out of the building. And the man was like facing straight down, like his face head down. And he was really confused about that because the apartment windows didn't open. The only way that you could get, the only ones that did open are like to go out to the balcony, but the other windows you couldn't open. So the man that saw this was just completely confused on what was happening. And he saw a woman just up in the window where he had fallen from just screaming and crying and carrying on. She was just beside herself. Josh ended up landing on a concrete roof uh, of the eighth floor parking garage. So his fall was 17 stories down to this eighth floor parking structures garage. Uh, experts have said that the fall itself probably only took three to four seconds. So Amber sees this. She realizes that he's fallen. So she runs down, uh, gets on the elevator, goes down to the eighth floor, just sees her husband just broken. I mean, he's clearly lifeless at this point. Um, there's blood, there's there's all the stuff that you would imagine to see when somebody falls 17 stories. It's pretty bad. So at 23 years old, Josh is clearly dead. Despite all of his traumatic injuries, Amber is just screaming, somebody help him, 
somebody bring him back. She's kissing his face and rubbing his forehead. She really seemed like she just wanted to undo everything that just happened. One of the first officers commented on the scene and the chaos. I mean, there was paramedics at Josh and there was police pouring into the apartment building. Uh, Officer Don Holloway said that his mind quickly went to accidental fall. A murder was like the furthest from his mind. It didn't seem like it. She wasn't acting like it. Didn't, didn't see that at all was not even investigating it in that way. So he clearly needed to remove Amber from Josh. You know, the paramedics are there. They need to take him away. So they said, we're going to take you down to the Tulsa Police Department to get your statement and we'll clear this up. So the police drove her to the, the police department and during this ride, Amber is just still upset. She's still crying. And she was asking the detective, are they still working on him? You know, still holding on to hope that they could revive him. So once they got to the police station, Detective Holloway ended up putting Amber and her grandma, because her grandma ended up joining her, into an interrogation room. During this time, they did not know that there was cameras and uh, recordings going at the time. And this is where things get a little spicy in this story. Holloway ended up going into an adjoining room. He could hear them and he can see them apparently in this room, but he was just doing paperwork. And then he heard Amber talking to her grandma in some very incriminating ways. I'll play the interview here. It's crazy. This isn't fair. I just want to go back in time. <laughs> I lost the person I love. The person I couldn't even imagine being separated from is dead. Stay together, I'm gonna kill him. How did this happen? How did this happen? Why did he have to fall out the window? <laughs> fall out a window? Why did mom put us in that apartment? <laughs> Why are we there? Why were we there? <laughs> Why didn't I just leave? <laughs> he was leaving. I kept just saying, and when he leaves, I'll go to my grandma's. <laughs> Why didn't I just leave? He'd still be alive. <laughs> we got both struggling. What do you mean? When you was... I can't get the image of him go. <laughs> Out of my head, him falling out the window. <clears throat> I'm just trying to tell myself this isn't real and this is all going to be over soon.
his whole body was broken. And I just held him and kissed his cheeks and screamed for him to wake up. This is gonna turn into a nightmare. Just have to pray, we'll get through it. I don't deserve to pray. Who am I praying to, Josh? Josh hates me. I'm not even gonna be able to meet him any in heaven anymore because he just hates me. I killed him. Stop talking like that. What kind of person am I? You're a loving person that has been abused by Josh just as well. No, I, I'm a horrible person who could do that. Who could do that? <laughs> Push my husband and make him fall out the window. <laughs> I wish I could just go back and know that if I pushed him it was going to happen. Amber, quit saying pushed him out the window. <sighs> Did you intentionally? No, okay. of course not. Okay, that's what they're gonna take it as, baby. That's why I said, everything that you say, they're gonna, in a different matter, because they're gonna say, okay, Amber. I just don't understand this whole, legal system no not that i don't understand the whole pattern of events of the last year <laughs> us getting married and going to alaska everything in alaska me being pregnant coming back here getting kicked out of mom's house going to the apartment and then all for it to just josh just fall out of a high-rise building <laughs> I wish y'all would have never went to the apartment. I mean, what are the chances? How many times has that happened? All Josh's friends, his family, they're gonna know he died because he fell out of a high-rise apartment. And I just keep watching him fall over and over and over again in my head watching him flail and think that he, you know, my last thought was, please catch yourself. <laughs> and I would just want to know what was going through his head if he knew he was going to die. <laughs> if he said a prayer or if he cursed my name or if he just thought that he could catch himself too. And then just watching him hit the ground. Is there no balcony there from the living room? No. For the rest of my life, everyone's going to think I'm a murderer. My family. My whole family. Amber, we don't think that, baby. All of Tulsa is going to know. I, do, I want to be the one that's dead. I want to be dead, and I want Josh to be here. <laughs> what's, what's little Levi going to do? They could save him. <laughs> so not only does he have to lose his daddy, he's got to lose his mama too. I just have to... just want to go back. Please, I just want to go back and just not... Not push him, just catch him something. <laughs> this can't be real. <sighs> I mean, I still have my whole life ahead of me. And I was supposed to spend it with Josh. And now I'm gonna go to prison. And Josh is dead. My baby's gonna get taken away from me. 
what caught Detective Holloway's ear was her saying, Josh is dead, I can't get it out of my head. Every time I close my eyes, I'm going to see it for the rest of my life. I just want to know what was going through his head. You know, she was wondering what he was feeling. This is going to turn into a nightmare. I killed him. Not good. And then, you know, her phrase is, it isn't fair, I'm a horrible person. She just kept on saying, who could do that? Who could do that? Push my husband and make him fall out the window? And then Amber's grandma, of course, saying, Amber, quit talking about you pushing him out of the window. Did you do it intentionally? Amber responds, no, of course not. I'm going to go to jail. Like she knew. She had a guilty conscience. You can tell that this is a woman who's going through it. I, th I think her words were her taking responsibility. Okay, I'm not going to get to my thoughts yet. I'm going to hold them in. I'm going to try to hold them in. So you could tell that she, there was genuine emotion there. And she was just trying to take responsibility for what happened. And of, clearly she was blaming herself. This, this story is getting released to the news outlets. Of course, it is just taking on a tale of its own. The story is basically being written that what's going to attract to the media, of course. People stopped looking at her as the pretty pregnant widow and more painted the picture of this evil spoiled monster. And then both Josh and Amber's friends started coming forward that their marriage was not the fairy tale at all. That there was lots and lots of, of bickering and arguments going on behind the scenes. And while they were in Alaska, uh, police had been called a couple times there as well. So there was trouble in paradise for sure. Apparently, one of the police reports said that Amber was eating a plate of food and Josh came up and kicked the plate of food and it, the food went on her face and the plate, you know, of course broke. But that was one of the complaints that Amber put against Josh. They were being toxic to each other, it sounds like. Nobody's innocent here in that regards. And then he also was getting in her face and then he, she has uh, breast implants and he apparently grabbed her nipple and was squeezing it as hard as he could. She says that he was attempting to pop her breast implant. He left bruises and burst blood vessels on her chest. Police photographed the inner injuries, so these were definitely documented injuries. Ooh, that sounds bad. And then, so this incident happened of this police report and the boob and the plate and all that. Well, only five months later, he was honorably discharged from the Air Force. Reports have said that it was due to his drug abuse and also evidence that he was selling them. So if, if that was the case, it would be a dishonorable discharge though, wouldn't it? I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't know much about the military, but I know if you, if you are, are doing something breaking the law that they dishonorably discharged you, but maybe they worked out something where he was on, honorably discharged. One month before Josh's fall, there was a police report on Amber, uh, actually a restraining order, because she hit him over the head with a lamp and he had to get stitches, he had to get staples. Like, that's some crazy stuff. Like, that's serious. So, yeah, he kicked a plate. I, you know what? It's not tit for tat. It's, I'm not even going to compare them. They were both toxic for each other, but hitting him over the head with a lamp is, is pretty serious. And of course, like I said, he had to get staples and stitches. So, I mean, that injury could have been fatal as well. And clearly nothing was learned from it. Uh, Josh's father reported that several times that Josh had called him just in tears. He didn't know what to do. He wanted out. And apparently one time he had told his father that Amber had pushed Josh down some stairs. 
the evidence is piling up and it's not looking good for Amber. But of course, Amber's parents had something to say about their relationship as well. So Josh got hit over the head with the lamp. He puts a restraining order on. The cops come to the house. Amber's mother's there to witness it. And apparently Josh and Amber are just laughing about it. it. They weren't taking it serious. Josh was no longer concerned about it. They must have made up and it was no big deal. They just kind of moved on with their life. So a lot of people were worried about both Amber and Josh, but it sounds like there was a lot of Josh's family and friends that really were concerned. Amber in her interview said that they always said I was going to kill him if he stayed with me. And so... There was definitely a lot of things stacking up against Amber and her very violent temper that she had. So in Amber's defense, the day of the incident, Amber describes it this way. And Amber has stuck to this same story throughout. She hasn't teeter-tottered, gone back and forth. She has gone with the same story. She recalls the repairman arriving to the apartment, her and Josh moving onto the living room, continuing their argument. Amber describes it that they were having just this yelling match at each other. They were about five or six feet away from each other, but then Josh moved in to her and reached to grab her shoulders to shake her. And Amber, in this defense of her pregnancy, her unborn son, that she's going to push him off of her. And when she pushed him, he fell backwards and fell out the window. So the neighbors uh, chimed in as well. They had some evidence in this case. They said that they heard the arguing going on and then they also heard what sounded like running like they could hear don't 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 some footsteps going on the window breaking and then a woman screaming no 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 and then a period of quiet and then a woman screaming oh my god oh my god oh my god it sounds like our apartment our apartments are so loud like you can hear you can hear people outside and if somebody's walking i can't we're on the top floor so we don't hear anybody above us but um you've lived if you've ever lived in an apartment you can definitely hear footsteps sometimes it's annoying so yeah they said they heard someone like running so it sounds like josh ran after her she ran after him to push him i don't know on uh, june 7th amber was arrested and charged with first degree murder largely based on the statements that she gave in her interview. It was so incriminating. And then later they changed it to second degree. First degree is intentional. Second degree was it wasn't premeditated. They believe that she meant for him to go out the window. That was her intentions. So of course, Amber's family is just in shock. They just cannot believe what's going on. They knew that they had their problems, but they knew their daughter not to be a murderer and they just couldn't believe what was happening. She would never murder her husband is what they're, they're saying and, and thinking. The first question that came up was, is this admissible in court? She wasn't under arrest yet she was just in a room with her grandma just venting some feelings so they tried to fight it but because because typically if they're questioning um they need to read her her miranda rights and then everything that you say or do will be counted against you well this was voluntary information that she was giving up she wasn't being questioned. She just was voluntarily giving this information up in the room. So they were able to use it because they tried to get it thrown out. But unfortunately, that did not work. Uh, Amber was released on bond two days after she was arrested. Uh, she ended up not long after giving birth to her son. His name was Levi. He was born in August. Beginning in December that same year, she ended up having her bail revoked. She got her bail revoked because she wasn't charging her ankle monitor. So of course, part of her bail was that she needed to have this ankle monitor refrain from drugs and keep it charged so they knew where she was. Well, she wasn't doing that. And she wasn't showing up for court-ordered drug tests. When she did show up, she was testing positive for marijuana. So things were just not going good for Amber. 
and being out on bond and just violating the way that she was, it doesn't appear to me that she was taking it serious. But on the other hand, she was going through a lot. So I don't know. So finally in March of 2003, Amber was to stand trial for the murder of Josh. So in the meantime, this case is just being so blown up in the media. This pretty princess is now the murderer, so it everybody wants to read about it, hear about it. Okay, so now the trial is is beginning. And the first decision is whether or not it's going to take place in Tulsa or not. Because this case is just so highly publicized, it's everywhere, it's in every newspaper, they were worried that they would have a compromised jury. And so they wanted to make sure that she got a fair trial, but the judge um, by the name of Kurt Glasso decided that it is going to take place in Tulsa. They're going to go on as business as usual. And then the judge also ordered that she could not bring in any evidence of Josh's drug selling, that that has nothing to do with the window incident, that they need to leave that out, which I found was interesting. He just said it wasn't relevant, so that was left out. The witness statements really weighed heavy in this trial. They argued that because Amber was only 5'5 five five and she was seven months pregnant, that she couldn't push Josh, because mind you, Josh is 6'4". He's a tall guy, he's over 200 pounds, he played football, he just got out of boot camp, he's a strong guy. And her only being 5'5 five five and seven months pregnant, that there's just no way that she would be able to do that. But also Amber did play sports, mind you. She played soccer, she ran track, she did dance, so she was in shape as well. So the prosecution painted this story that Josh was messing around with the TV in the living room when Amber got a running start and then pushed him so hard that he he fell out the window. So the witnesses that I mentioned earlier, they actually seen Josh fall face first out the window, or at least not out the window, but they seen him going face first once he left the window. So prosecutors said that he must have been pushed from the side or behind to fall that way, that he wasn't pushed backwards and fell out. So they theorized that once Amber learned how fragile the windows were from the basket, the laundry basket incident, that she premeditated this, that she thought in her head, oh, those windows are really thin. And so when she saw Josh in front of it is when she was like, this is my opportunity and went and pushed him. That's the prosecutor's theory. But Amber continued down the same route. She stuck to the same story that it was self-defense. She stated that Josh always has had a, a temper, that this isn't new. She said that she went in to attack as far as his character, that he spent a lot of time doing drugs and going out to the bar, partying, going to strip clubs. She really was painting him in a, in a bad light, which could be true. I... I don't know. It was her defense, though. During the trial, they showed pictures of Amber with bruises that Josh had given her. They had taken those pictures of her breast when he did that, so they had those. They had some evidence that Amber was getting abused by Josh. The defense also argued that how did these witnesses witness him going head first out the window or after he left the window because it literally was only three to four seconds before he hit the ground. He was going about 75 miles per hour in the air. So they're wondering, did they really see it? Because sometimes your brain just paints in the lines if you don't have a full picture. And so they're the part of the defense is, did they really see it? The day that this incident took place, Josh had already packed his bags and it appeared that he was prepared to leave. Amber stated that he had his bags packed already for Tennessee, the decision that had sparked their argument because he wanted to go to the concert with his friends in Tennessee while Amber's dad's getting married and they were supposed to be part of the wedding party. But Amber saying he was already packed for his trip to Tennessee and he was leaving. 
But Josh's father said that he had called him that day shortly before his death and told him that he was planning to leave Amber. Josh's dad said that Josh was getting frustrated because he couldn't stop Amber from using drugs even though she was pregnant with little Levi. And Josh also stated that he planned on leaving her, divorcing her, and getting full custody of their son. So that's all very interesting. Josh asked his dad if he would come and get him, but Josh's dad was at work, so he wasn't able to. And so Josh uh, found a ride with another friend, and he was just waiting on this other friend to come and pick him up. So Josh was going to be out of the picture, hopefully getting a divorce, but no, this happened. The prosecutor brought up also as well that the repairman, the maintenance man, said that he heard Amber say just after the fall, quote, my husband fell out the window. I pushed him. He's probably dead. Amber agreed that his bags were packed. However, she said that he wouldn't let her leave because she wanted to leave him. She said that she was kicking him out because of the argument that they had and that she was the one that wanted the divorce. And so Amber was able to provide a text to them to prove that she was leaving them, allegedly, that she wanted to leave him. And this is the text. This is Amber. I don't believe anything you say anymore, so don't waste your time. Josh, 10 minute is all I ask for, I'll be home. Amber, this is not your home. You're just staying here. Ooh, Josh, I want to have a home with you. I'm sorry I've been such a shit. I'm done of complaining and always trying to spend my time with my friends when I should spend it with you. So that was the end of that text message. And then neighbors also reported arguing before the fall, like they heard that. What they heard was a male voice yelling, what do you want from me? And then a female lady saying, I just want you to grow up. Paramedics that showed up on the scene said in court that Amber admitted I pushed him. So there was no denying that she actually did push him, but they were just trying to prove wasn't intentional, was her thought to, to push him out the window. So during the trial, they asked Amber to recreate this push. So now she's not pregnant. Of course, they gave this disclaimer to the jury that of course she's going to have less strength right now and so she pushed one of the detectives in the courtroom and it hardly moved him let alone pushing him hard enough to fall back lose his balance and then fall out of a window they argued the prosecution argued that that's because she had a running head start that was the that the running sound that the neighbors heard below. And so three hours after the, the jury was sent out to deliberate, they came back with a verdict. Amber was found guilty of second degree murder of her husband, Josh Hilbering. The jury recommended 25 years. The prosecution was completely satisfied with the 25 year sentence. Amber broke down in the courtroom stating that she's never gonna see her son grow up. Very, very sad. And what's more sad about this is Amber in the beginning was offered a five year deal to manslaughter. And I believe that is super fair. Manslaughter, even though you know it could have been an accident, it still happened and it was still your fault. So she didn't want to do that though. She felt like she's just going to leave it in the jury's hand. I really think she thought she was going to get off, but instead she refused that five-year deal. She could have been out in like three years possibly and she got 25 years. I honestly think and total respect to her family and everything. I, I just kind of think she's a brat. <laughs> and I'm not saying Josh was an angel. It sounds like it was toxic meeting toxic. We know that she was dangerous because she did cause an injury that needed both staples and stitches. So that only tells you that there was nothing learned from that. They stayed together 
and then laughed about it. So anyway, so there's more to this story though. It does not end there. And so Amber was very, Amber's family was very vocal. They did not agree with the sentencing at all. Particularly her mother, Rhonda, was really advocating. They said we're a high profile family and that's why she was targeted. That this was all media as to why she was convicted, not because she was actually guilty. She said that they wrote their own narrative. The rich bitch kills the military hero. I could see that. And that there had been more evidence that was not presented in the trial that may have given Amber a chance. I don't know what that evidence is. She referred to it as a modern day Tulsa witch trial. <laughs> That's kind of extreme. In February 2016, Dr. Phil came to the correctional facility, Mabel Bassett. It was in McLeod, Oklahoma. He actually went there to interview her. He was able to ask her some questions about how she felt about it and did she think she had a good chance in court. She said that um, Josh started getting high again. I don't know if that's marijuana or something stronger, but right before he went to boot camp, when he went to Texas, and then he was having withdrawal from it. But despite those claims, uh, Josh's autopsy came back and it was clean. He had been kicked out of the Air Force and Amber said that that he was not in any rush to find a real job. So I guess my assumption was right that I couldn't find any evidence that he was working and it sounds like he wasn't working. But I don't think she was working either. She said that he wanted to continue selling pills and that is why he wanted to go to that concert in Tennessee rather than attend Amber's father's wedding with her. So I could see why she would be mad, but everything escalated that afternoon, she said, and when he grabbed her, she called him a coward before pushing him off of her. And that was the last words that he heard before he fell to his death. Ooh, that's bad. Amber said, I wish, this is a quote from Amber, I wish I could go back and know if I pushed him, it, it was gonna happen. And then Dr. Phil said that he generally does see remorse in Amber. And I do think that Amber does feel extremely guilty. You, She's not a cold-blooded killer. She did not plan to kill Josh, in my opinion. I feel that this was an emotional time, a very toxic relationship, and they were feeding off of each other. But I don't think she sat back and thought, oh, that window's thin, I'm going to push him out of it. I really just don't think that was her intentions. If you're anything like me, you're wondering, how the heck does this man fall out of a window. This is not a broken window. This isn't a window that opens up. This is a window that's closed, sealed around the edges, glass pane. How does he fall out of it? And there's a huge ledge right there. And so that was the question on everybody's mind. So what they ended up doing is hiring a window expert to check out these windows. And their findings were just incredible. So this building is an older building. It was 1966, I believe it was built. I'll put the year up here if I'm wrong, if I'm not remembering that correctly. But so the building was 46 years old. So Mark, a gentleman by Mark Mouchelon, He's a Chicago window inspector and he inspects the windows on high rises. And he was the expert witness during the trial for the defense. He wrote a full report of his findings, and it was incredible what he found out. He found out that the windows were original, 46 years old, while some of the glass in the building had been replaced. Mark felt certain that the place that Josh fell um, was original. He noticed that there was cracking and distortion were visible on the interior side where lots of caulking had been applied throughout. And Amber said that there was often like water leaks and air leaks through these windows. So the glass was so thin, they compared it to like a picture frame. It was that thin. It wasn't tempered. It wasn't laminated in any way. Mark Guy, this expert, said that he finds it very unlikely that Josh wouldn't have fell through it being how thin it was. So it was no surprise because this glass was so thin. And it's 27th floor. It's or 25th floor or 
whatever. But I tried to find if they've done improvements and I did find one article that said that they had put like a million dollars into the building, whether that was the glass or not, because I imagine after this trial, that apartment suffered. So they would almost have to replace the glass. So I, I bet they did. The quote from Mark, the expert said, to put it mildly, the incident glass would break easily in the presence of moderate impact. When he was pushed, you know, I I assume that she just think, thought that he was going to bounce off of the window or catch himself, not knowing that this glass is super thin and easily with any pressure could break. A laundry basket broke it. So anyways, so the glass itself was 16.2 square feet around and then the bottom was about two feet above the floor to the beginning of the window pane. And then the window was uh, 6.5 above the floor. So this means when Josh hit it, he would have been right in the center of it, right at its weakest point. So I just wanna read this quote from the expert, the glass expert, Mark. The Hilberings and the Whitlock family suffered a fatal set of circumstances that came together on a fateful day. It started with domestic dispute, which brought Josh Hilbering to indirect contact with the weak, unsafe, poorly supported glass in a poorly maintenance building on a day when chimney pressures were almost pushing the glass out. When pressures were sucking the glass and him out and the wall beneath the window added for whatever tipping may have been in progress, as happens so often in death and injury cases, factors piled upon one another creating a catastrophic result. So Amber's parents would go and visit her often in the jail. They went there probably about two times a month and they would also bring little Levi, her son, with them. And it, what's cute is that, I don't know if it's cute or sad or or what, but it, my initial thought is how precious, but he described her as living in a castle and because she was so beautiful that they had guards to protect her, which is adorable to the picture that the, he painted of his mom, which was in his small young mind, he believed was true. But on October 24, 2016, Amber's mother and father both received voicemails from the jail but they weren't able to pick up and so they tried calling them back and after like multiple times of trying to call them they either got hung up on or they got transferred uh, and they just couldn't reach anybody they were getting frustrated like why are you trying to call me and so finally they reached somebody in the prison Rhonda said that the person on the other end in three plain words said she is dead and hung up the phone what regardless of anything that is not what you tell a mother i just couldn't believe it i'm like how cold could one person be it's just awful so in the next eight hours amber's family is going crazy they tried everything to reach somebody at the prison, you know, unsuccessful. They had no information and all they could do was just fill in the blanks from what they're hearing on the news. So sad. I feel so bad for that family. They found out that Amber was found dead in her cell. Apparently another inmate found her and she was hanging from her curling iron, straight iron cord and it was wrapped around her neck once her body was found 15 minutes they after she was found they pronounced her dead and then her autopsy report revealed that it was asphyxiation hanging by suicide is what they ruled it as people from the prison and guards were reaching out to amber's family stating that they should really do an investigation that they don't believe that it was suicide and Amber's family strongly believed that it wasn't suicide. She was looking forward to the days that she was getting out, that she didn't portray any of the suicidal 
tendencies that you would usually see, like feeling lost. So her family was completely confused when they initially heard, but then when they had guards and other people in the jail telling them that they need to do an investigation is when they were totally sold that they didn't believe it was suicide at all. So the questions started arising regarding the prison and this really a suicide. This is definitely a questionable death. There was cameras everywhere in the prison, but apparently the camera that was the one that they needed to capture this on camera wasn't working. Why does that always happen? That the one camera, like we pay a lot of tax money. What are they doing to these cameras? <laughs> but this particular camera wasn't working. The family doesn't believe that the camera footage even surrounding has ever been investigated. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but they believe it wasn't. They said that the time of her death was like a social time. And so prisoners would have been out in public areas. Like somebody would have seen something and somebody had the opportunity to do something to Amber. During the autopsy, they saw scars that are found on Amber's wrist and arms, which were assumed to be self-harm. Like she was cutting herself to deal with everything that's going on. She had scratch marks on the left side of her neck, abrasions on her right side, and a red and purple bruise on the right side of her jaw, all which her family believed to be self-defense wounds. Uh, during Amber's autopsy, the, they also found meth in her system. Uh, of course, like you would expect, there was severe damage to the neck and her sternum was broken, which is consistent with performing CPR. So there was no question about that. They requested their own autopsy and the court denied it. I don't understand. I think this is cover up. If they're denying them, they this costs them no money. All they have to do is release the body to her so they could do their own autopsy and they said no. Is that even legal? I don't understand that. How can they say no? They don't own her body. So the rumors are flying. Some of the other people in the jail said that people didn't like Amber. Like she wasn't liked by all. I could see that, you know, here's this pretty young rich girl who killed her, potentially killed her husband. You know, there's probably some jealousy going on and they didn't like all the media attention she was getting on top of it all. And I guess she was receiving special privileges. I don't know if that's true or not. People claim that the guards were mentally torturing her with Josh's death, like joking around about it that they have to close all the windows. Someone even said that they witnessed her forced to wear a dog muzzle while out in the yard. God, that sounds awful. In September of 2018, this was two years after her death, a cryptic message was shared in loving memory of Amber Hilbering. And this was a Facebook page and it says, it's unknown who exactly it originated from, but it was in quotes, Oklahoma Department of Corrections and Mabel Bassett Correctional Center are responsible for covering up the murder of Amber Hilbering and making it look like a suicide. Amber Hilberling was murdered by an inmate named Patricia Rucker, T. Rucker. Two hours before Amber was found, there was a cellmate by the name of Rucker who was doing a life sentence told Amber just to go kill herself. Rucker was housed in a separate block as Amber and technically not allowed to come into Amber's pod, but the guards let it happen anyways. It was often that this rule was broken. And so Rucker was in prison for strangling her girlfriend over 20 years ago. So she was bad news and she was in there for strangling, so. I don't know. Amber's body was found hanging from the cord on, from a hair straightener. Her body wasn't removed from her cell for hours. She was left there so long that the prison's internal affairs department got there before the medical examiner. I think this is common, but I could be wrong. There were claw marks on Amber's neck where she was trying to fight off the attacker and remove the cord. But I think that there is 
that uh, self-defense mechanism that comes into place where you try to save yourself, even in a suicide. So why they find this so hard to believe is because Amber had already scheduled these news appearances and interviews. She had one the next day. Like she, she was actively arranging things. It wasn't like she was suicidal and just decided last minute. But of course you include drugs into that. You add somebody egging you on to just go kill yourself. She's feeling down. It was Halloween. She wasn't able to see her son. So I mean, there's, there's a lot both ways. I could be sold on both ways. It's, it's really just hard to say. Amber was working with Dr. Phil in an interview coming up. The local news station, KJRH. You know, like I said, she had things coming up. What Amber's mom is stating, or this unidentified person is saying, is that they're trying to cover it up. They don't want anybody to know that an inmate got killed by another inmate and they did nothing about it to prevent it. She wasn't supposed to be there. I mean, there's just a lot of things that could have helped prevent this from happening. And then the camera being out, was she even being watched? Like, what's that all about? Just 24 hours before Amber had died, she wrote a letter to a local news station that were reaching out to her requesting an interview. The letter arrived the day after Amber died. So she had already mailed this letter. So like I said, she was making arrangements. So so to this day, we just don't know what happened on that day. And the only people that will ever know is, of course, Josh and Amber. Uh, their son is being raised by the grandparents, by Rhonda. Rhonda says that she'll never go a day without letting Amber's son know that how much he was loved. He lost both of his parents. That's got to be so traumatic. Rhonda continues to fight for her innocence, both for the Josh murder as well as the cover-up in the jail, potential cover-up, allegedly. She's still fighting. It's got to be exhausting for her, though. What a, what a tragic incident. But in my honest opinion, I just really think that Amber's thought was not, I'm going to murder my husband. I think that they both were very immature. She was only 19 years old. They had a toxic, violent relationship. You add some hormones on top of that, some thin glass, and it was just a recipe for disaster. Do I think that her past of hitting him over the head with the lamp and causing the stitches and the staples did not prove that there was definitely some violence from both of them because Josh had uh, left bruises on her as well. But it just shows that the lack of respect that they had for each other, it was inevitable. It was going to add this to the way that it did end or they could have separated. It sounded like he was two steps from the door of leaving anyways, or she was gonna leave him, I don't know. But I just don't think that she deserved the 25 years that she got, but of course I felt like she did deserve something. And the fact that she wasn't taking it serious by not charging her ankle bracelet and failing drug tests, and I think she really did have a chemical dependency of some sort. And it's you know evident before she went into jail and then even after she's in jail, they they're able to prove that she has meth in her system. I don't know. This is a tough one. I, do, I don't think she deserved the 25 years, but I do feel that she was guilty of domestic violence by pushing him, which inevitably caused his death. If you take a couple drinks and you go and hit somebody and kill them, you're going to get murder. You're responsible for your actions. If you are not intoxicated and you go and you hit somebody and you murder them, then it's a car accident. So domestic violence is domestic violence. But I'm curious to what you guys think about this case. Do you think that Amber des deserved the 25 years that she got? Do you think this was a jail cover up or did she actually commit suicide? And anything else that you wanna leave down in the comments, I really appreciate it, you guys. Have a great day. I'll hear I'll hear you in my next one. I'll see you in my next one. Bye.